It is uh, last Sunday before Easter. It's also called what Sunday? Anybody know? Palm Sunday. If you got that right, go to Wendy's and get a free straw all day. All right. Uh, it's Palm Sunday, and so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Palm Sunday and all that is in with that. Uh, it's also, uh, if you have not been to the Seder meal, it's going to happen Friday. Uh, this is an event worth coming to. Uh, I've been to some of these, and it's so dry that you leave going, that was boring. I've been to some of them that are so goofy, you don't know what's going on. Uh, this guy came last year, and it was so good, I said to him, I'm booking you up today for Good Friday next year. And I'm telling you, my kids were engaged. We had discussions for like the next two weeks about how the Passover and, and Jesus connected. And so again, if you're able to be here Good Friday, you want to be here. It was just, it was just good, all right? It was worth coming to. And again, all the connections that were made were just so wonderful to hear and delightful to be a part of. All right, so before we get too far into Palm Sunday, let's go back over just kind of our memory uh, click to help us kind of remember what's going on. It's a simple way to speak to the gospel message. And it started actually at VBS last year. I used this with the kids. And the kids, like months later, were coming to me going, Hey, you remember this? And I went, yeah. And I just thought to myself, you know, we have trouble as adults remembering this story. And so let's just break it back down to the way we taught the kids. And let's just tell it like this to everybody one time here over Easter. So show me your dancing hands. There you go. You ready? We were created to give God our applause and affection. Sin entered in. And we could no longer give God our applause and affection. We had given it to Satan. Jesus died. Don't hit your neighbor. Yeah, last week somebody got a broken nose right here. I think. Jesus died to pay a debt that we could not owe. To remove the sin from that relationship. Because of Jesus, he stole back our applause and affection. Yay, Jesus! There you go. Now you got the entire gospel story right there. You got it all down, all right? Now here's what I want you to think about. Palm Sunday is a victory Sunday. It is a Sunday in which we celebrate, proclaim that, hey, the King of Kings has entered in. And if you don't know the story, I'm going to give it to you real quick. The story is this, that Jesus says to his disciples, hey, there's a donkey at so-and-so's house. I want you to go get the donkey. We're going to ride in on Palm Sunday. Okay, which is, remember, the Sabbath was Saturday. Palm Sunday is the day after the Sabbath. So it's not Sunday like you and I know it, thinking, hey, it's church day. All right, we're going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. All right? And if you're thinking to yourself, that sounds like a really weird way to enter in with a parade, you are correct. And Jesus comes riding on a borrowed donkey into the city of Jerusalem on Passover week. And this is the biggest, most electrifying week and all the Jewish calendar. All right, it was estimated that possibly as many as a million people gathered around Jerusalem on this celebration day. It is the big day. It is the top of the top. But it is also politically charged because revolt after revolt has taken place either inspired because of Passover events or because of Passover events. In fact, the Passover remembers the exodus out of Egypt where God rescued us. And it remembers that God set us free not too long ago from the Greek oppression. And now we have the Roman oppression. And we are waiting and anticipating God to do that again. And here comes Jesus, the one who might be the next king of kings, riding in on a donkey. Little children and people from all around gather palm branches. They rip them off the palm trees and they bring them and they throw them down at Jesus' feet, or excuse me, the feet of the donkey. And Jesus rides in on palm branches and people are also throwing. Anybody else know? This is worth a free straw at McDonald's now. This is stepping it up. Anybody else know what else we threw on the ground in front of Jesus' donkey? Their coats or cloaks, their outer garments, right, as a symbol of royalty. And so the palm branches were a symbol that we recognize this to be the next Davidic king, the warrior king, the mighty king who was going to reestablish the kingdom of God. And so we threw the palm branches down, which were a symbol of that, and our cloaks were a sign of we surrender to you. And so Jesus rides over all these, and then the children are shouting a phrase which has great power. They shout, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the phrase Hosanna literally translated. So this is pretty cool. This is like a little moment of teaching for you. Hosanna is a transliterated word. 
which means that we don't have English words that we put in your Bible for that. We took the very word and stuck it right in your Bible, Hosanna, which means that you guys know Hebrew. Hey, isn't that pretty cool, right? You can actually go home and tell people, do you know any other language? You say, I know Hebrew. Don't tell them how much. Just say, yeah, I know Hebrew. And your friends will all be like, wow! And you can say, yeah, I just learned it Sunday. I've been working with a Rosetta Stone and my pastor. We took a couple classes. All right, I know, I know it pretty good now. So Hosanna literally means this. It means, Lord, come save us quickly. Come rescue us. Save us quickly. Lord, come rescue, save us quickly. So when they're shouting Hosanna, they're actually shouting a prayer of deliverance. Hosanna in the highest. I mean, Lord, come quickly, save us. Is how the parade march goes. And it is a victory march. It is the big celebration. It is awesome. It is a spectacle to behold. And it is one of the most confusing moments in all of Scripture. that leads to the most confusing moment ever where the king who came in on the donkey dies on the cross for us. And we just need to be honest as Christians, as those of us who have embraced the story, as those of us who say like, hey, this is part of my story now, this is part of who I am, we need to be honest with ourselves and with others that this story doesn't always make sense. You know why? Because you grew up like I did, all right, with cowboy movies and RoboCop, all right, and Clint Eastwood. We grew up thinking that the good guys show up, shoot the bad guys, rescue the gal, kiss her, and then ride off into the sunset, and everybody goes, woohoo! Right? And that's a great movie, right? That's a great show. That's the ones I want to watch. All right? We're at home. I tell my family, look, I'm not watching any of your drama stuff. I want something. I know how it's going to end. I want to know the good guys win. I want to know the bad guys lose. I want to know the guy gets the girl. The girl gets the guy. I don't care how that works. I just want it to end that way. And if it doesn't end that way, I don't want to watch it. You know, my kids come home like, Dad, this movie was so sad. You got to watch it. I go, I don't want to watch it. Why would I want to watch something that's going to intentionally make me sad? I want a happy movie. I want to know how it ends. All right? And when we get to Palm Sunday, we have the hero who walks in, and you and I go, I know how this story is going to end. The King of Kings has come in. There's a big parade. They're shouting Hosanna. He's going to save everybody, reestablish the throne, and I know how this should end. And then one week later, we're going to hit Good Friday, and we're going to see Jesus on the cross, and you and I are going to scratch our head and go, huh, never saw that turn coming. That is a new one. In fact, the disciples didn't either. In fact, as they lived into that story, for the next three days, the disciples are bewildered and lost. This isn't what the story is supposed to be. You are going to reestablish the kingdom of God. And now you're dead. And what do we do? We're going to go hide in a room because surely Rome's going to come kill us next. Now that's kind of the big setup and the bigger picture of what's going on. And now I want to take you into the, like why we wrestle with the story and why we should and why we should stand at the end of it and declare, How great thou art, you confuse me and bewilder me with your love, God. And before we get there, I just want to give you this hint. Those of you that are married, I hope this is kind of how you feel on a regular basis. Those of you that are dating, if you don't feel this way, you should dump whoever you're dating until you find someone that makes you feel this way. Those of you not dating, this is what it should feel like. You should wake up every day and go, I have no idea why you love me. But your love overwhelms me because I don't deserve it. And to be honest, it's a little confusing because I know who I am and I am just amazed that you care. And guys, if you can make your gal feel that way, you're doing great. Ladies, if you can make your guy feel that way, you're doing great. And that's the example that Jesus is going to give us right now. A love so amazing, it's confusing. All right, here we go. You ready? Now I'm going to lead you into the crisis. In communication, they always teach us, look, before you explain to people what, they, what you want them to know, tell them why they need to know that. So I'm going to, I'm going to walk you into the crisis. You ready? The problem is, is that I struggle with what God's doing. There are days that I sit down and pray with God and I go, hey, I don't, I don't 
know if you've been paying attention here lately, but it's not going well. Like, I don't know, maybe you took a break, God. I don't know, and I don't want to insult you, but I just, I just want to be transparent and say, things have went to hell. And not just in my life, but God, I can give you life after life after life after story. And I just don't think you're, you're watching anymore. And we need you to, Hosanna moment, we need you to come rescue now. Come on, we all do this. Drunk driver kills someone with their car. Don't we go, where, where, where were you, God? And it's easy to hear it on the news, but it's another thing if you're a part of this community and you go, we know that kid. They got killed. Babies are born addicted to crack. When you're holding that baby like I got to hold Taco for six months as he goes through withdrawal, you cry out to God, this is not right. Bombs blowing up soldiers, families falling apart, children being abused. And maybe the pain is more personal for you. Maybe your story has the loss of a loved one. Maybe your story has someone that's just been diagnosed with a disease. Maybe your story is, I'm putting my life back together because the twists and turns I've taken I never saw coming and it's led me to the brink of destruction. Maybe you have a child or a grandchild has rebelled or maybe your parents have left you and you feel abandoned. And you cry out to God, where are you? This isn't what I expected when I was thinking of a God of love. When we shouted, Hosanna, this wasn't the rescue I anticipated. Isaiah 55, 8. Anytime you think, hey, I really feel good about what I know about God, turn to Isaiah 55, 8. I love it. It's one of my favorite scriptures that says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Which, by the way, most of the time I go, Amen. Right? Because my brain is tiny. And I can't see past them all. It says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Because what I want as the God of justice who comes in with the six-shooter, the sword, the bazooka, puts down the bad guys and we move on. Right? I want to help you. I want to give you just one more story to push you over the edge. Alright? It's, it's, it's a charge story. But as I walked through where I was like, I, we need one more just to help us crawl into the moment where we go, yeah, that ain't right. Where is God? Where's the God of justice? Rabbi Zacharias tells a story. He tells a story. He was getting on a plane. They were leaving Calcutta. And he says he, he went to his seat and he's checking his number. He finally finds his seat. He puts his stuff in the overhead compartment and he looks down and there is a lady with her head onto the window just sobbing. And he goes, so I thought to myself, well, this is great. Normally, they don't start crying until at least I've started talking to him. And he goes, now I've got to sit beside someone who's just sobbing and going to be an emotional train wreck the whole way. He says, I sat down and did all the pre-flight stuff. And he said, finally, I turned to her and I go, ma'am, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? He said, we talked for just a little bit. And then he said, and then she found out I was a pastor, right? A preacher, an evangelist, right? And he goes, at that moment, the entire conversation changed. He said, she stopped crying. She turned and looked at me and said, I don't know you, but I know that you will understand. And she said, I work with a, a group that comes to Calcutta and we rescue young ladies from the sex slave industry. And she goes, my time is up. I got to go back home and raise more funds. I'm going to be gone a month and my heart is broken from what I saw last night and the fact that I won't be here for an entire month to rescue. And she goes, can I tell you what I saw last night? He said, I'm here listening. She goes, it'll break your heart. She said, there is a street that men go to in Calcutta. It's called Venom Alley. Venom Alley. They go to Venom Alley and what they do is they get an alcoholic drink that is mixed with a snake venom. She goes, so not only are they depraved men who are coming anyways, but now they have alcohol and then a snake venom induced into the alcohol that goes into the blood system and literally makes these guys lose their minds. She goes, and then they pay for sexual favors. She says, I'm part of the group that wanders that alley rescuing 
women and children. And she said, last night, we heard a young child screaming in pain. And we found a little baby, three years old, and stole her away from the arms of this gentleman who was If at that point in time, you don't also start to go, yeah, where is the God of justice? Right? Like, where is the God who shows up, kicks down the door, shoots the bad guys, grabs the little girl and says, this will never happen again. I'm saving this world now. See, now I'm into the emotion of the story. Now I've connected with what the Jewish people at Jesus' day were feeling as their children were constantly stolen by the Romans, as they were being oppressed. And again, I just, the emotion of the story I've crawled into because now when I shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, I'm starting to go, yeah, the problems that I'm facing aren't, I mean, they're not that big. But that's, that's evil at its core. And now I begin to go, well, God, yeah, well, God, where are you? How come you don't rescue? Why didn't you show up? When I sit with the father whose son was killed by the drunk driver, why didn't God do something there? Listen. The world fixes problems through force and violence. Jesus saves us from sin. And in the process of doing so, he exposed the false power structures of this world and revealed the ultimate power of God's love. What I mean by that is that Jesus didn't come to end all hurt, all pain, all suffering. He came to give your pain purpose. Your suffering, he came to give it meaning. He came to save us from sin, not to end all those things. And sometimes that frustrates me to death. That he chose to leave us humans with free will and the ability to continue to harm each other. But Jesus models a behavior and a way of leadership that we as the church have to not only understand, but have to live into the confusion of it, have to move to the how great thou art moment that your love is overwhelming and I don't deserve it, I don't understand it, and, to, and we will now behave that way. When Jesus was given a choice to use force instead of love, he always chose to use love. <clears throat> the key to the message of Palm Sunday is the cross. But to understand Palm Sunday, I want to take you back and show you that it was a consistent message through Jesus all the way. Matthew 5 has this wonderful story. If you've got a Bible or your e-vice, you want to open it up. Matthew 5, we're in verse 38. Jesus is teaching the crowd and he says these phrases that you may have heard. In fact, you may have heard them and they were twisted and wrong because you missed all the context. Ready? Jesus says this. You've heard it said, meaning somewhere in the Old Testament, Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You got your optometrist and your dentist right there. All right. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them also your other cheek. And most of the time when we've heard that, we went, oh, Jesus wants us to be a pacifist. That is not what Jesus is saying at all. Let me give you an example. All right, and the Roman society of Jesus' day, it was a lot different than we have today. People had two hands back then. They had a right hand and a left hand, and that was it. Very different than our culture. And they wrestled with oppression, and they wrestled with abuse of power, and they wrestled with tyranny. Again, just so much different than our culture. We wouldn't understand it all. They had two hands, and they had all those things going on in their culture. So different than anything you and I encounter, okay? Here's how this works. If you are a Roman soldier... You had permission to slap any slave or anybody under you with your right hand. And you didn't need permission. You could just do it. You could smack anyone you wanted with your right hand. Now, you didn't use your left hand. Because your left hand was for... Well, it's, yeah, you got it right there. Yeah, you didn't have toilet paper. You just you had a left hand, Okay. Now you're with me, right? So when you went to eat, you always used your right hand, and this was the other hand. Okay? Everybody with me? Anybody confused? If you're confused as to why you didn't use the left hand, talk to your neighbor later. Okay? They'll get it for you, all right? 
And so you would only smack someone with your right hand. So you've been smacked across the face by a Roman soldier with the right hand. Jesus then says to do what? Turn the other cheek. He says, turn into what's coming. Now you and I miss this because we don't understand the culture here. But a Roman soldier can't punch you unless they declare that you are their equal. You see, if a Roman soldier punches you, what they have said, as a slave, I slap you, you are beneath me, and I oppress you. When they punch you, they actually are saying that I declare you my equal, and we are now engaged in an equal fight, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And Jesus isn't saying, hey, go ahead and start fighting. He's simply saying, I want you to level the playing field. Force them to acknowledge that you are not below them. Change the system dynamics. Change how everything takes place. So you've been smacked. I'm below you. I'm a slave. I turn. Okay, you're not going to smack someone into their face. You're going to punch them. Jesus says, go ahead and turn into them. Say, the next time you touch me, you are acknowledging that I am your equal. It's a big deal in a culture that's been oppressed. It's a big deal if you are below and beneath. It's a big, big deal. Jesus isn't saying be a pacifist. He's saying, hey, conquer the world through a different means. He goes on and says this. The next one is, <clears throat> And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Now again, you and I read that and we're like, that don't make any sense. And it shouldn't if we don't understand the culture. So in Jesus' day, you had two pieces of clothing that you wore all the time. Okay? You had what you and I would look at and go, that's kind of a nightgown type thing. That would have been your undergarment. Or in this passage, they're saying your shirt. And this is where our translation doesn't help us. All right? We called it a shirt. And you and I are like, yeah, we got shirts everywhere. Here we go. You probably only had three pieces of clothing in your entire wardrobe. You probably had two cloaks and a shirt. Or again, your undergarment. All right? And so Jesus says, if anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, your undergarment... Give them your cloak, your outer one, as well. Which means then you're left wearing your naked. Right? Now you and I hear that now and we're like, oh my gosh, why would you ever want to do that? Now here's what's going on. Jesus says, look, if someone can take you to court, and they do it legally, because you owe them a debt. You've been working your tail off to pay this debt. You're doing what you can. And they take you to court, and they have the audacity... All right, to call that debt up. And they have the audacity to want to subject you to nakedness. Let them do it. Now, here, here, stay with me a second. Ready? Listen. In Jesus' day, if you wanted to strike a deal and you owed someone debt, you would hand them your, under, your undergarment. Or you, you would just say, hey, here's a symbol that I owe you and I'm going to pay you back. Okay, and so they would just take that home and hang it up in the closet and it was a symbol and when you paid back the debt you would return that to them. It was an understood way of doing business. Okay, I owe you a personal debt. I'm giving you a personal garment. Sometimes they would trade a staff that again had symbolic meaning and value or again the undergarment. So they would hand that to the other person and now this person is calling a debt and they're taking you to court and you have been trying to pay that debt. You have been doing your best. Okay? And they are so angry. They are so self-righteous that they would rather see you naked. <coughs> they would rather see you naked than to continue to receive payments. Jesus says, let it happen. In Jesus' culture then, so here I am, I give you my undergarment that you demanded. Take the outer one too. In Jesus' culture, the shame of the society would not have been on the naked person. It would have been on the person who caused them to be naked. You and I have this kind of reversal with that. You and I go, man, I'd be so embarrassed to be there naked. Don't get me wrong, that didn't happen. But the embarrassment would have been on the community. Do you remember when, when uh, Noah's sons come and see him naked and, and the, the two other sons, they come and they cover their father up. They walk in backwards into the tent because it was shameful to even see someone naked. And so in the culture of Jesus' day, the shame would have been on the culture. So the minute you say, hey, if you're going to treat me like this and oppress me and abuse me, and you want my undergarment, take the outer one too. 
Everybody see what this man has done. And the community would have been, oh my gosh. And people would have ran to you, taking off their coats and covering you up and despised the person who has just oppressed you. And now, who is the victim in the story? You are. Who is the good guy? You are. And those who've rescued you. And the person who once had all the power suddenly is the villain. Do you see how Jesus says, spin it. Change the system. It doesn't have to be the way you thought it was. All right, now turn to your neighbor and give him a high five if you're with me, if you're understanding where we're at. Okay. So a few high fives. So, so there's been a theme that Jesus has been teaching the whole way. About, hey, here's the social power structures of the world, and then here's the way God's people will do it. Here's the social power structures of the world. Here's the way God's people will do it. And then we get to Palm Sunday. We get to Palm Sunday, and here's what I want you to know. Did you know that Palm Sunday is actually about two parades? You and I only have it recorded in our Bible about one parade. But the whole story is really about two parades. There's the parade of Pilate, and then there is the planned counter-parade of Jesus. Let me walk you through this. So Pilate, all right, on Saturday, on the Sabbath, would have entered the city the day before, all right, Passover started. And Pilate would have entered the city, and, and you see it in the top photo here, all right, Pilate would enter the city with a giant army, and the Roman soldiers marched with a cadence and marched with a technique that was in to incite fear in the people. And so they're dressed up in all their leather, leather and all their metal, and they would have had a one, two, and then you take their shield and they bang it across their chest. And the idea was that it sounded like lightning reverberating off the hills. In fact, if you study ancient history, they say that you could hear the Roman soldiers' fear march and the drums beat from miles away. And people were terrified long before the Roman army ever got there. It was intended to scare other armies and people from even fighting them. And so it's an intimidation tactic from the word go. One, two, bang. One, two, bang. And just imagine the metal hitting across their chest and the soldiers looking so intimidating. At the front of the line of soldiers, you see there's a big stick. At the top of the stick, there's an eagle. And it was supposed to be about 14 foot high. And that was a symbol of the Roman government and the occupation and the dominance of the Roman government. And so you would have seen that long before you saw the soldiers. You would have heard the soldiers and the thunder and lightning sound of the march and the drums. And then you would have seen this eagle and this stick coming in declaring that Caesar is God. And that would have you would have said, hey, a serious army is coming down and they would have entered into your city or into your land and you would have been terrified. And then right behind the stick would have been whoever the leader was. In this case, going into Jerusalem, it would have been Pontius Pilate who would be riding a... not just a horse, but a... what color horse? A white horse. Very good. Symbol of purity. Symbol of power. And so Pilate enters in riding a white horse with the soldiers on horses. And again, this is intimidating. You're... A Jewish people, you're standing aside. Part of you wants to see what's going on. Part of you is just hitting your children. Because why? The Roman soldiers don't need reason to just take your child. They don't need reason to just enter into your house and steal your food, to take whatever they want. They don't need reason to knock you down, to smack you, to beat you up. They just do whatever they want. Here comes the army. They're walking through the city, right? And you are hiding. You're maybe fleeing. You're like, hey, if Rome's here, we're out of here. We're heading out. And Pilate enters in with an absolute show of force. Why? Because of all the political electricity that has charged this Passover celebration. Because Pilate doesn't want there to be an insurrection. He doesn't want there to be any turmoil. And Pilate enters in with intimidation, oppression, force, abuse. Think of a negative word and you can probably put it on with Pilate. So Pilate enters in. Go to the next slide, guys. Pilate enters in on our map, and he enters in from the west over here. So here's Pilate. He comes in from the west. Guess which side Jesus comes in from the next day? He comes in from the east. And Jesus comes in. Remember, they've just seen this amazing parade where you're just wowed and terrified and scared. And you're, it's like one of those train wrecks. You're like, I can't look away, but I can't not watch because it's just so impressive and intimidating. Wow, look at how Pilate came in. Why would anybody ever stand up against that force of Rome? And then here comes Jesus and his parade. At the front of his parade, he's got 12 clowns. We call them the disciples. Right? They can't get their act together. They don't know what's going on. The only thing they're missing is a little car and the red noses, right? 
And here comes the 12 disciples, and they're marching people through. And he doesn't have soldiers. He's got little children. Right? And they're waving palm branches, not swords and spears. And he doesn't have mighty soldiers or sticks uh, declaring that here, here comes the Son of God. He's got kids shouting Hosanna in the highest. Come rescue us quickly. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he doesn't have people running out of his way and scattering because they're afraid. He has people running in front of him throwing their coats down. It is the exact opposite. It is the total counter of force and display that Pilate has just issued. If you had been there and watched Pilate entered in, you would have recorded it and then you would go and watch Jesus entered in and you would have said if you could paint a picture of the exact opposite display, it would have been Jesus who enters in, not on a mighty white steed, but on a... Jesus came riding Eeyore! The guy can't even find his tail! Not just a donkey, but a young donkey, a colt! There is nothing more anti-intimidating than a big dude on a donkey. I'm telling you. We had a halflinger for a while, and I would ride, and we would ride, and, and there were moments where I'd have to pick up my feet if we were walking over a log, and my dad would laugh, and he'd go, you just look so silly on that little horse. And he goes, there is nothing intimidating about you, and you are an intimidating dude, because there ain't nothing happening on that horse. Can you imagine Jesus on a tiny little colt? Nobody goes, oh my gosh, it's Jesus, get out of the way. They all go, that's the guy we're supposed to celebrate and worship? That's the king, the one we've been thinking, would, that's the new David? And the people are confused. Because my expectation, this is, this is the key, you ready? We've done all this build up right here for this. The expectation was for a warrior king. And what they got was a humble servant come to save them from sin. God is always more concerned with the eternal than the temporary. And what did the world do when they encountered such love and such humility and such grace? The only thing that the darkness knows how to do with it. When the darkness encounters such light that it is blinding, there's only one response that ever comes from the world. We kill it. When the rulers of this world encounter the power of God's love, the only response is to kill it. Jesus' planned triumphal entry is a counter parade to Pilate's grand entrance. Pilate's procession embodied the power and the glory, the violence of the empire that ruled the world of Jesus. Jesus' procession embodied the alternative vision of the kingdom of God. If someone slaps you, turn the other cheek. If someone steals your, your shirt, give them everything. Jesus' parade enters in declaring, if you are paying attention to the high story in which the king of glory is about to perform a sacrificial act, so that you can give God back your applause and affection. The king of glory is about to steal back your applause and affection from Satan. If you're following the story, if you're following the story, the heist has just taken a turn and everybody went, I never saw that coming. Even the disciples who are hiding in the upper room for the next couple of weeks, excuse me, the next couple of days going, what do we do? The one we thought was going to be the ruler has died. It is, at this point in time, a very confusing story of love. Because I want, when I look at what's going on in the world, the warrior, mighty king to set stuff right. But Jesus didn't come and give us what we wanted. He came and gave us what we needed. Revelation 5, 6 says this. Because sometimes the story of God doesn't make sense because we don't understand. Because listen, we are about to witness this Easter the greatest act of violence as the Son of God is killed on the cross. We are about to witness the greatest act of love as the King of all creation who stepped down from the throne of heaven gave his life for us. And it can be frustrating. God did not come to end violence but to expose it. God did not come to end suffering but to give it meaning and purpose. God did not come to rescue us from pain but he comes to say I will use that to grow my children up. Revelation 5 
There's this moment in heaven where John's having the vision of the end times. And there is this scroll that must be opened in order for the, the end of times to come. But nobody can open it. It has been sealed and nobody's worthy. And he cries out, nobody's worthy to open it. And John weeps and mourns because it is the scroll that holds our souls back from eternity for God because it has been sealed with sin. And John says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. And then all the saints sang a new song. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were the mighty conqueror who came and beat the enemy up and shot him with the guns and chopped off the heads of the bad guys and won and forced everybody to behave, right? No, the lamb was worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because he was slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons of every tribe, language, people, and nation. Amen? So Friday we're doing uh, packing for the Easter egg hunt. And there's a bunch of people out here in the hallway packing. And it, it kind of, as people began to leave and not leave, uh, they started doing more decoration. And when people start decorating, this is what happens. Guys kind of start to fade out of the way. Just, it happens. I, maybe not for you, but I just, I noticed that pattern. And I'm one of those. Like, hey, we're at the decorating part. You're done moving tables and chairs. You're done doing part that I will appreciate. And so I faded out of the way. I faded into my office and thought, I'll just sit down and look over the sermon again. And I'm in there typing on the sermon. I get a call from a, a good friend of mine <coughs> who is in Chicago. And she's visiting another friend. And that friend happened to go to school with me. I know it's a long, confusing story. Hold on, I'll get you there. And you need to know this. I don't have great memories of college. Like my memories of college, I think back of painful events and times. I don't have stories of, it was so cool, we did this, and then we did that. I mean, I have some of those stories, and most of them are about how stupid we are, right? Which probably is most of our college stories, right? But my college stories are filled with some tough stories. And then there's another layer of college stories for me that are so painful, they're beautiful. Let me say it again. They're so painful, they're beautiful. And here's where I want to put this oxymoron phrase together for you. That it can be so good it's bad. It, that, that the love of Jesus is so overwhelming it's confusing. I, I want to put it all together in a story. Because this is what I found happening. As my friend's telling me about all these memories that her friends have and we're doing this three-way conversation which was confusing. All of a sudden I'm sitting at my desk and I just start sobbing. And I was not ready for this moment. And I am at my desk just sobbing. And it's so bad that Cindy, the children's pastor, comes in and goes, Are you okay? And I'm like, This is the coolest moment I've had in a long time. And I am okay, but it is painful. And she goes, It's a cool moment that's painful. And I go, Yeah. I'll tell you later. Because this is what happened to me. And I've not thought about it for years. But my... Junior year of college was my sister's freshman year. And I remember walking into our dining commons and I was talking with someone and out of the corner of my eye I catch someone who's sprinting from the other door like 25 yards away sprinting at me. And I look up just in time to go, this person is coming at me. And I look up and recognize that it's my sister who's doing her freshman year, and my sister doesn't run up to me. My sister jumps into my arms trying to tackle me. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm a big dude, and my sister was not such a big dude, and so I was managed to just take a couple steps back as she is gripped onto my neck like she is being chased by a herd of pit bull dogs. And I'm holding her, and I'm looking around, literally thinking there's got to be somebody out to kill her, right? This, this isn't how we behave. And I, I'm like, are you okay? Thinking something's terribly wrong. And she won't let go, and she is crying into my shoulder. And I go, are you okay? And she says, Aaron, just hold me. I miss Daddy. And I don't have anybody here to hug me. And I need hugs to know that I am loved. And I started crying as the big brother. And I am squeezing her as tight as I can. 
And she says, don't let me go. And so I'm holding her. For even for me, a huggy type person is going, we have passed the affection moment and we are at the uncomfortable stage of hugging. And I am on the phone just sobbing, remembering that that is my favorite memory of my sister. And I'll never get to do that again until we get to heaven, but I know it's coming again. And when I cross that door, she's going to run up to me and go, I've been waiting. Here's the part of the story that's awesome. My brother, who was sitting at a table eating, and at that time, who he was sitting beside didn't know that I was his brother or that Carrie was his sister, didn't understand that relationship at all. But looks up and says to my brother Ryan, Look at this! Would those two go get a room? Ryan says, I looked up thinking I'm going to see somebody making out or something. He goes, I look up and it's my brother and sister just hugging. And he looks and goes, oh, it's okay. That's my sister. And the guy goes, you're okay with your sister all over that guy like that? Ryan goes, I didn't have the heart to tell him. (laughs) He said, I just let it go. And he he said, "I, I just laughed and laughed and laughed. And he said, I know Carrie... And I know how much she needed those hugs. And I know how much you meant to her as a big brother. And I know what was going on at that moment. He said, but if I told this guy, he would never understand what was going on in that moment. He wouldn't grasp the power of love that was taking place. Or the appropriateness of it from a brother to a sister. Listen, when we look at the Palm Sunday intro, And we tie that all the way to the cross and the resurrection. We have to acknowledge that the story is at the very least confusing to someone who is unable to embrace the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ and who wants the cowboy hero to show up and shoot it out. We have to admit that that love is so confusing because it's so powerful that it's hard to understand. So I was talking with someone this past week who had just gone through a pretty rough divorce. Uh, I say just gone through. It was about a year ago. And they were sitting down with me and they were talking about dating and all the stuff they were going through and all the challenges they had and how they keep picking the wrong guy. And I said, well, let's do this. Why don't we sit down and write a list of like what you really want? Because right now you just seem to be jumping to the next guy that looks at you, says you're attractive and asks you out. You don't have any standards. I said, write down a list of like, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I want. This is what I'm expecting. And I said, just at the very core of you, what would you expect and want from a guy? And she paused for a long time. And then she said, I want someone who puts me first. I want someone who loves me so much they'd be willing to die for me. I want someone who wakes up every day and sacrifices their day for me. I want someone who, and she paused for a long time, and then tears started to come down her eyes. And I'm thinking, oh, this is why I hate counseling. I don't want to be here with someone crying. It's the sensitive part of me, right? And she said, I want someone who treats me like Jesus. And then I started crying, and I said, yes, this is why I hate counseling, because I don't want to cry with anybody, right? Right? And I thought, that's it, right there. That's Palm Sunday. The love so powerful that it overwhelms us even to the point of confusion, to the point where we stand up and go, how great thou art. I don't deserve it. I never will. I couldn't earn it. I never will. But you give it to me because you are so awesome. And the story and the conquest of my heart the stealing back of my applause and affection is the greatest story ever told. And it should change everything about how we love others. Amen? Will you pray with me?
the Holy Spirit. I just sense that there's somebody listening maybe online or right here with us today who has been wrestling with not just your story but the confusion of it and the, the struggle of why didn't God just set things right from the beginning. I pray that today this message has penetrated their heart and that has allowed them to take down walls that have separated you from them. I pray that you overwhelm them with your love. That today, Father, that there is a point of acceptance of your grace that maybe they have never known. I pray that you drench, drench them with your affection. I pray that they surrender all that they are to the cross. That they be washed by the blood of the Lamb. Made whole and holy and perfect through your grace and your love. Lord Jesus, may we as an entire people cry out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And may we hang on to a love that's so daring, so powerful. It's even confusing to anybody who hasn't received it. In Jesus' name we pray. My prayer for you today is that in the message that you became a little bit overwhelmed by the love story. And that maybe we help make Palm Sunday make a little more sense that why didn't Jesus come and just set things right now? And I pray that you leave just shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Come rescue. I look forward to seeing you on Good Friday. And the next Sunday, guess what? It's Easter, the biggest day in church history. I can't wait to see you. In the name of God, the Father Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come, you are blessed. Go forth and live as Easter people with a love that is so big it confuses the world. Amen.